him. So with that, Dr. Jason Lyle, thank you. All right, well, it's very good to be with you this evening. I am going to do two presentations, and in the first one, I'm really going to give you the solution to all the world's problems. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, um, the Bible is the solution to all the world's problems, but there is an impediment to people believing the Bible, and part of that comes from uh, the creation-evolution controversy. So I think it's very relevant. We live in this amazing nation, the United States of America. We have the most Christian churches and media and television, Christian resources of any nation, we have a wonderful Christian heritage. Even today, we, we think things are bad, but we have it so good compared to any other nation or looking back in, in history. I mean, it's just amazing because our nation was founded on Christian principles, primarily by Christians. And yet, for all of these Christian resources, it seems like we as a nation are becoming more pagan every day, less Christian every day. Doesn't it seem that way? It's just incredible. Even just, it seems like it's picked up in the last couple of years even. So what is going on here? Well, if you think about it, every problem in the world today can be traced back to a broken law of God, where people have said, yes, I know the Bible says that, we're not going to do it that way, we think this is better. That always causes problems, always. And the intellectual justification people try to give for why we shouldn't believe the Bible is they think it's been disproved by science, they th and particularly in Genesis, right? They'll say, well, you, you can't believe, you know, God creating and a worldwide flood, Noah and all the animals and that, you know, that's, that's nonsense. And now, they don't, that's not a scientific argument, by the way, but that is the, that's the impression that people have, is that the Bible's been disproved by science. But um, really, the issue between creation versus evolution, it's the same as all these other issues. It's God's word versus man's word. Who are you going to trust when there's a conflict between the two? And I want to suggest to you the loss of biblical authority beginning in Genesis is the root of the decline of Christian America. Because once you reject the Bible at the beginning, once you reject God's word as the standard, there's nothing to prevent an unlimited spiral into wickedness because it's just arbitrary opinions after that. And this battle began, ironically, in Genesis when God told Adam, if you eat from that tree, you will surely die. And that was passed on to Eve, and Eve did, she decided she wasn't going to obey that. She did a little scientific experiment to test God. Now, God was right, and she was wrong. Adam followed suit, of course. But you see, the test was whether or not they would take God at his word, whether they would recognize that the only reason that they can trust their mind to any extent at all is because it was created by a trustworthy God. So no one's saying Eve shouldn't have thought about it. She should have. She should have recognized, now wait a minute, you know, I've got God telling me this, Satan telling me this, but God's the one who made me. He made my mind and my senses. And so if my mind and senses are trustworthy, God had better be trustworthy. Therefore, Satan, you're a liar. Get behind me. That's the way she should have responded, and history would have turned out a bit different. But uh, God is gracious and merciful, and he wanted to show his mercy uh, to those of us who are descended from Adam and are wicked by our very nature. We're, we're sinners descended from sinners. It used to be in this nation, because of our Christian heritage, people had a kind of a quasi-Christian worldview, even if they weren't Christians. They tended to think in terms of Christian morality. And you could say things like abortion is, well, that's wrong, and homosexual behavior is wrong. And, you know, people would say, yeah, I get that, I understand. The good book says that. Even if... They hadn't received Christ as Savior. They had some degree of respect for Christian morality. Today, you say abortion's wrong, homosexual behavior's wrong, adultery's wrong. People say not according to my rules because that foundation has shifted. Our, our culture is not standing on the rock of God's word anymore, but on the shifting sands of man's opinion. And there's no end to that. There's no end to that. And that's really what evolution is. Evolution, and, and when I use the word evolution, I'm referring to... Uh, the uh, Darwinian idea of common descent, that all organisms are descended from a common ancestor over uh, hundreds of millions of years. That's what I mean by evolution. Uh, sometimes the word evolution can just mean change, and well, we all agree things change. That's not in dispute. But I don't believe that I'm related to back, uh, you know, something like a bacteria or, or, or you know, broccoli or whatever th like that. I, I was speaking to a group of atheists one time, and I said, you realize in your worldview you believe you're related to broccoli. And afterwards, one of them came up and said, weren't you kind of poking fun at us for saying we believe we're related to broccoli? And I said, but isn't that what you believe? He said, well, yeah. I said, well, there you go then, right? I mean, don't shoot the messenger, right? If that sounds odd, maybe reconsider your belief. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just reflecting back to you what you claim to believe. Um, I don't believe we're related to broccoli, but I do believe we're related to each other. We're descended from Adam and Eve. And what you believe about origins will have consequences for your other beliefs if you're logically consistent. 
If you're a logical person and you believe in creation according to God's word, you'd expect to have laws because there's a lawgiver. And, and we learn that in Genesis, that God is a linguistic being. He spoke the universe into existence. He communicates with Adam and Eve. He created Adam already to, able to speak. I was always a little jealous of that. He didn't have to go to grammar school. He could just speak right away. That's kind of neat. He's pre-programmed with language. God can do that. And of course, he gave, he gave them some instructions on what to do and what not to do. And, and God has the right to do that as he's the creator. And so we have laws. Laws make sense in a creationist worldview, a biblical worldview. And we see that there are punishments when those laws are not followed. And we know what the punishment is because God is the king of kings and lord of lords. Disobedience to him is high treason. That's capital offense. We understand that. Penalty's death. We get that from Genesis, don't we? Marriage. Where do we get this idea that marriage is one man and one woman united by God for life? That goes back to Genesis, doesn't it? Because God created Adam and Eve. And the Bible specifically says that that's the basis for marriage in Genesis 2. For this reason, the man shall leave his father and his mother and join to his wife and they shall be one flesh. So God created marriage and therefore he gets to define it. Not the Supreme Court, God defines marriage. Standards, standards of behavior, standards of clothing. I noticed you're all wearing clothes today. I appreciate that. I'm sure you do too, right? Well, where do we get the origin of clothing? It's in Genesis 3. We get that. It wasn't originally that way, but because of sin and the shame associated with uh, a sin, God provided skins of clothing. Those would be animal skins that he provided for Adam and Eve. Uh, meaning of life. Why is it that human life has intrinsic value? And, and more than just, you know, animals. I mean, I realize we're classified as a mammal in the modern biological scheme, but we're different from animals biblically because we're made in God's image. That's unique to human beings. And that's why we have inherent intrinsic value. We, we reflect in some way, we reflect God. That's an awesome privilege. That's why I can't just go out and shoot somebody that I really dislike. That person's made in the image of God and therefore deserves dignity and respect. These are biblical creationist principles. But today there's another option, right? Because now people are taught in pretty much every government school and in the media and at the movies that evolution is the way that life came about. You find it in just about all the textbooks too. That's, you know, that we're just basically rearranged pond scum. There's no creator. And if that's the case, then why would you have laws? Because evolution is supposed to work by the strong eliminating the weak. And yet laws are designed to protect the weak from the strong, right? That's why they exist. And so they're anti-evolutionary by their very nature. Or why not do what you want with sex for that matter? If we're just animals, animals do what's instinctive, why shouldn't we just act on our our feelings, our impulses, or abortion. I mean, you know, if, if we get rid of spare cats, why not get rid of spare kids if we're just evolved animals? And you can see the connection there. And by the way, I'm not suggesting that evolution is the cause of all those uh, social ills. Sin is the cause of those social ills. But I am suggesting that evolution gives people a way to try and justify that sin in their minds. Because you see, you can't defend those Christian standards on that evolutionary foundation. It doesn't make sense. And that's the problem because that foundation has been eroding in the minds of people. They think you can't trust the Bible because they think you can't trust the first chapter. Well, if that's the case, then why would marriage be one man and one woman for life? I mean, if Adam and Eve's just a fairy tale, then that means marriage is just a cultural trend. It's just something that came along. And hey, the culture changes, so why shouldn't the definition of marriage change? And that's not a hypothetical. That's the actual argument the secularists like to use. It really is. You can't defend the Christian doctrines on an evolutionist foundation. It's not going to work. But we get intimidated because there are some brilliant people. There are brilliant scientists who believe in evolution. I don't deny that. There are brilliant scientists who believe in creation, by the way. I have the privilege of knowing a lot of them, actually. But in any case, people get intimidated because there are smart people who believe in evolution. They think it must be right. But then... There are those who want to remain Christian as well. They say, well, I believe the Bible, but I think, I think maybe evolution's how God did it because all those scientists say so and they're so smart. And uh, we get intimidated. But if that's the case, if evolution's the way God did it, then Genesis is not literally true, right? It's not literal history. And you'll find uh, believers who will say that. They'll say, I'm a Christian, I trust in Jesus, but Genesis is just, maybe it's written poetically. It's not meant to be taken literally or you know, it's some kind of um, poetic device or maybe it's like a parable where it's, not, it's meant to illustrate a spiritual principle, but it's not meant to be real history. But that's not the way Genesis is written. Genesis is written as history. You know those verses that you love to read before you go to bed, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, and they beget so-and-so. 
those genealogies like you find in Genesis 5. Those verses are there for a reason. They're there to show us that these are real people that live. It gives us their names. It gives us the names of at least one of their uh, offspring. And then it gives, uh, in many times, all kinds of irrelevant, boring information like the, the time between when the one person was born and the next, and then the time afterwards, and then the total time that they lived, and it adds up. So the Hebrews did know how to do arithmetic because they were not common core. So in any case, <laughs> you wouldn't find that in poetic literature and you certainly wouldn't find it in a parable. Jesus often used parables in his earthly teaching ministry, but a parable is where you, uh, you explain a spiritual principle by relating it to something physical that we're familiar with, right? And Jesus was masterful at that. But you wanna make that as concise as possible, make the point and move on. You wouldn't have a bunch of irrelevant details, like you know, specific names. Usually in parables, there's not even a specific name. It's just there was a certain man or there was a king. That's the way t uh, parables are generally, uh, generally written. You don't, you don't see that in Genesis, nor is it poetic in nature. Hebrew poetry is easy to recognize. It's different from English. We tend to focus on rhyme and meter. In Hebrew, they focused on parallelism. There's a few different kinds of it, but one parallelism, synonymous parallelism, is where you say something and you say the same thing effectively using different words. So, so it's synonymous, right? Like the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Right? See how heavens and skies go together and God's glory and the work of his hands go together. That's Hebrew poetry. I think it's wonderful that, that God uh, wrote the original text of the Bible, you know, the Old Testament in the Hebrew language where poetry is based on parallelism rather than rhyme and meter. Because if it was based on rhyme and meter, it would be lost in translation. Right? Words that rhyme in one language don't in another. But parallelism survives, and so we can appreciate that beauty uh, even in an English translation of the Old Testament. This is, but my point is, you're not going to find that parallelism in Genesis. It's not there. You might find an individual statement somebody makes that's poetic in nature that Genesis is simply recording. But it's written in historical narrative, and that's the way the Jews recorded their history. This was written by people who were there, and they, and they, they saw these events, and they recorded them. And by the way, those genealogies lead up to Jesus Christ. And read, you can read about those in, um, in Matthew and in Luke. And so, you know, a lot of Christians say, oh, but, but I think Adam's just like a metaphor. He's not a real person. But, but wait a minute, Jesus is descended from him. If, if you're a Christian, you have to believe in Jesus to be a Christian. But how are you going to have a real person descended from a metaphor? <laughs> it doesn't work, right? You don't have to be an expert in genetics to know a real person can't be descended from a metaphorical person. That's not going to work. It's theologically important that Jesus is descended from a real, literal, historical Adam. Why is that important? Because we all are. According to Acts 17, God has made from one man or from one blood all nations of the earth. Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. She was to be the mother of all the living, right? So we're all descended from Adam and Eve. That means Jesus is our blood relative. Broccoli is not your cousin. Jesus is your cousin. <laughs> Jesus is your cousin. And that's important because according to biblical law, only a relative can redeem you. According to biblical law, it has to be a kinsman redeemer, a relative, a blood relative. Jesus can substitute for us on the cross because we're all of one blood, meaning we're all related. He's our, he's our distant brother. And for that reason, he can pay the penalty. His blood is our blood. He can pay our penalty on the cross. But Jesus is also God, and therefore he can pay an infinite penalty. And so that's why, that's why it had to be Christ to pay for our sins. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. Now, they were used symbolically in the Old Testament, right, to teach the Jews about substitutionary atonement. The, you know, this, this animal, uh, which is innocent in, in terms of sin, it dies. It's, it gets your punishment, and you live even though you're the one that deserves the death. There's a, there's a great exchange. It doesn't actually pay for sin, though. It just pointed the way toward the coming Messiah. And so that's, it was used symbolically. But the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sins because we're not related to them. Unless, of course, evolution's true. In which case, that doctrine's gone. Isn't it in Genesis where we learn that death is the penalty for sin? Now, if that's not the case, then why did Jesus have to die on the cross at all? You see how it undermines the gospel when you start removing the history that the Bible teaches? Putting it another way, which Adam is non-essential to the gospel? Is it the first Adam that made it necessary for us to be saved by sinning and putting a barrier between us and God? Or is it Jesus Christ, whom the Bible refers to as the last Adam, who saved us, who, paid, who took our penalty, paid it on the cross? Without the first, the second, the last Adam is unnecessary, right? 
You see, the gospel's the good news. The good news is that Christ provides salvation for sin. But in order for that to make sense, you have to understand the bad news. And the bad news is that Adam blew it right from the beginning, and we're descended from him. We've inherited that sin nature. We sin from our own perverse choice. And we need, it. We need someone to pay for our sin and to change our nature. That's something only God can do. Only God can do that. See, the Bible really is the history book of the universe. It does contain poetic literature, like in the Psalms and Proverbs, but it's primarily a history book recording the events that happened in history, written by people who were there, right? And I find that a lot of people like the morality the Bible teaches, but they want to reject the history. Even atheists like some of the morality the Bible teaches. Thou shalt not murder. They like that one. They don't want to be murdered, right? <laughs> Thou shalt not steal. They like that one too. They don't want their wallet stolen. But the morality comes out of the history. Why is it wrong to murder? Because human beings are made in the image of God. And God has forbidden that in his law code. You see, the, 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 the morality comes out of the history. You can't separate them logically if you're going to be logically consistent. Jesus put it like this. When he was speaking to Nicodemus, he said, I've told you earthly things and you do not believe. How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? It's a pretty good question, isn't it? The Bible talks about both, earthly things and heavenly things. Earthly things like things that happened in history, the creation of the universe in six days, the flood that took place at the time of Noah. And the Bible speaks about heavenly things like morality or salvation for that matter. But if you say, yes, but I'm not sure I believe those details in Genesis are literally true. If God didn't get the details right in Genesis, how can you trust that he got the details right on how to inherit eternal life? That's really the, I guess the issue is, does God know how to communicate? Now, I think any being who can speak the universe into existence can communicate, especially with those beings that he made in his own image and, and gave them the gift of speech right from the beginning. God does know how to communicate. The Bible really is pretty clear. Now, I, I'll grant there are some difficult doctrines in there. Creation isn't one of them. It's very straightforward. God is very clear in what he has to say. We just don't like what he has to say. That's really the issue if we're honest about it. And so you've got God's infallible word, and then you've got man's fallible word. And there, again, there are a lot of smart people. I, I don't deny their intelligence who believe in evolution. They're wrong, but that doesn't make them unintelligent. But we get intimidated, and we think we've got to make those two agree because we want to we be Christian. We want to trust in Christ, but at the same time, we want to accept what the secular world says about origins. And if you're going to make those two agree, you're going to have to modify one of them because they don't agree, right? And the one you modify, oh, it doesn't really mean what it says. That's the one you don't really have your faith in because your ultimate standard, you can't alter it or you need a greater standard to tell you how to alter it. So, and, and by the way, people don't do the reverse. They don't say, well, yes, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Christian and I believe in evolution, but I think Darwin's origin of species was just symbolic for biblical creation. He was actually a six-day creationist. People know better. They read, they read the book and they take it in a straightforward fashion as it's meant to be understood. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they were masterful at reinterpreting God's word to fit with their traditions. And Jesus would have none of it. He would take them back to scripture. It is written, have you not read? Matthew 15, scathing indictment there. You hypocrites, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. You can think of the culture war that's going on today a bit like these two cities. There is a culture war going on today and the two main faith systems that are competing, at least in this nation, Christianity and secular humanism. Those are the two. There are others, but those are the two big ones. Christianity, based on creation, based on God's word is true from the beginning. And then you've got secular humanism. That's based on an evolutionary worldview. Secular humanists tend to be evolutionists because that's, that's the origin story of secular humanism, where humans are sort of the greatest thing to have evolved from this line. And we can do what we want as a result of that. We're our own gods. And there are certain symptoms that arise if you have that way of thinking. And again, I'm not saying secular humanism is the cause of those social ills, but it certainly fuels it. Because if you think you're just rearranged pond scum, you can make up your own rules. If you're not accountable to God, you get to do what you want. And what people want to do is often very wicked. The Bible explains that. We have a sin nature. We get that. So how are we fighting this war? Well, we are zapping those uh, billboards, and I think we should do that. I think we should fight against racism and abortion and so on. But if that's all we're doing, 
we're just, uh, we're just trying to alleviate symptoms rather than dealing with the actual problem. And those are going to keep coming back because those are the natural outcome of a way of thinking that is contrary to God's word. They really are. The secular humanists are smart. They're aiming at our foundation. They're saying you can't trust the Bible because you can't trust the first verse in the beginning God. That's silly. We know in the beginning, big bang, hydrogen gas. I think that's really rather silly, but that's what they claim, right? And the worst thing we could be doing is helping them, representing Christians who are zapping our own foundation, saying it doesn't really matter what you believe about Genesis. Zap. Well, it does matter. It does matter. So how can we be more effective? Well, I think it's fine to zap billboards. We need to do that. We do need to fight racism, abortion, etc., sexual perversion. That needs to be fought against, no doubt. But we need to defend ourselves from these attacks when the evolutionists say, well, you can't trust the Bible because of this, that, or the other. Now, I'm a scientist, and I kind of specialize in, in the scientific aspects of that. But we can all say, no, that's contrary to God's word, and therefore what you're saying is false. We can, we can all do that. And we can point out the problems with evolution, which is not a logical scientific idea, really. It's a scientifically bankrupt speculation or conjecture about the past. It's not something that has good support. And I have yet to hear a good argument for Darwinian, you know, evolution in the Darwinian sense. They usually point to things changing within a kind, which is what creationists believe in. So that's, we need to do, we need to do some damage there ourselves. We need to repair the damage that's been done to creation and show people you can trust in God's word from the beginning. And the science lines up with that when you understand the science. And, and frankly, the biblical worldview is the foundation for doing science because it's, scientists used to understand this, that the reason we can do science, the reason we can probe the universe and do experiments and get results that are consistent is because God upholds his universe in a logical, consistent way for our benefit. There are patterns to be discovered in nature, and God has promised us that there are certain patterns that will continue as long as the earth remains. He gives us some examples of those in Genesis 8.22. So I have a promise from God that there is a certain degree of orderliness in nature and therefore I can study it and draw conclusions. And scientists used to know that. We've kind of gotten away from that now and it's kind of interesting. Anyway, I like how this is illustrated because we're not shooting at those people. We're shooting at that city which represents a worldview contrary to God. We're to cast down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And then I and again, the, the people, we, we want them to abandon that Abandon that city, because it is going down. I read the end of the book. God wins. There, was, there wasn't any doubt, right? <laughs> but the question is how many victims will be taken with it. That's, that's the problem. Well, in any case, we want them to abandon that, that sinking city and swim over and join us on the city of God. We want them to become Christians. We want them to be saved. And that's why we do what we do at the Biblical Science Institute. For me, this is not an academic game. I'm not interested in debates and things like that. I mean, I do some debates, but it's for the purpose of seeing people one to Jesus Christ, okay? That's why we do what we do. Well, what about the time scale of creation? There's some controversy there, although there really shouldn't be. The Bible says that God made in six days. It tells us what he did on each of those days of creation. Human beings are made on the sixth day, and from those genealogies you love to read, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, you can add up those ages with some other information, and you find that the time span between Adam and uh, Christ's earthly ministry is something like 4,000 years, and that ministry was about 2,000 years ago, so something like 6,000 years ago is when God created heaven and earth and whatever's in them, and boy, that is not a popular position in academia. It really isn't, and that's okay. Uh, and, but we get intimidated again because you'll see in the textbooks millions of years, right? The fossils allegedly were deposited over hundreds of millions of years, right? Because when you dig them up, they come with a little label telling you how old. No, they don't come with a little label. No, they don't. Oh, but they can radiometrically date them. Actually, they don't date fossils anyway. They date rocks. And um, that's basically all that is is making a guess about the age of the, of the rocks by measuring ratio, ratios of isotopes. I'm happy to talk about that. But it doesn't actually give you the age of something. It's a guess. Yeah, but people get intimidated because they see those numbers in all the textbooks and you see it in the movies and, and uh, all, all kinds of stuff like that. And so we get intimidated. We think it's got to be true. And yet it's certainly not what the Bible teaches. The Bible gives a much shorter history than the secularists. By the way, the secularists, you understand, they need the millions of years in order for evolution to sound even remotely feasible. Because we all know that you know, one kind doesn't change into another on the time scale that we can see. And so they kind of sweep it under the rug of millions of years. Well, given enough time, eventually one kind will change to another. 
But uh, because Christians get intimidated by that, we think we need to fit in the millions of years into the biblical timeline, because again, the scientists, you know, they're just never wrong about anything, right? <laughs> I say that as a scientist, but anyway. Well, you can't, where are you going to put the millions of years though? You can't do it between Adam and Christ because that would destroy those genealogies, right? You can't say, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, and then a million years later they beget so-and-so. No, that doesn't work. There's just not that many people between Adam and Christ. And in any case, even the secularists will concede that human beings don't go back 100 million years. Human beings are recent. No doubts there. So people try to put the millions of years into the creation week because that's the only place they can think to do it. Well, where are you going to fit the millions of years in the creation week? Some people try to put it actually before the creation week. They'll say, that, you know, millions of years happened before the beginning. That's pretty easy to refute because if the millions of years happened before the beginning, then the beginning wouldn't be the beginning. <laughs> It would be the much later, right? And that's not what the Bible, it's not in the much later that God created heavens and earth, it's in the beginning that he did so. So that's not going to work. Or they'll try to put a gap of time in between verse 1 and verse 2, the gap theory, a couple different forms of it, ruin and reconstruction and so on, for which there is no evidence in scripture. But I, I'm going to come back to that one. One of the most common, though, is to say, well, God didn't really mean to say he created in six days. He meant to say that he created in six ages. So those days are actually symbolic of vast, vast long periods of time. And uh, you know, then my question is, then why, why did he say days? Because he does say days, right? And some people have said, oh, but, but Dr. Lau, there's, there is no Hebrew word for a long period of time. Which is kind of a strange argument. Like, like, I, you know, like God forgot to make a word for a long period of time, so he just hoped, you know, so I'll just use day and hope they figure it out. Uh, well, it's not true. There are several Hebrew, Hebrew words that indicate a long period of time, like olam, which means a long period of time. Yeah. <laughs> So that's, I mean, God could have used that if that's what he, if he, that's what he wanted to say. So no, he, he uses days. And some people say, oh, but there is evidence that when God uses days, there are long periods. Because after all, 2 Peter 3.8 says, one day is with the Lord is a thousand years. So there you go. I think it's funny, the only quote, the first part of that verse, what's the rest say? One day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. It cancels that right out, you see. It goes the other direction. <laughs> Uh, it's not giving you permission to change the word day everywhere you see it in scripture to a thousand years. And by the way, that would make the earth 12,000 years old instead of 6,000. It doesn't get you anywhere close to the 4.5 billion that people think they need to add to the, the biblical timeline. Uh, when you read this in context, by the way, it's, it's not saying a day is a thousand years to God. It's saying it's like that or as that. It's a simile, right? It's comparing two things that are in fact very different. Um, it's showing us that God is beyond time. The context of this it has nothing to do with the days of creation. When you read it in context, it's not talking about the creation week. It's talking about God delaying judgment so that many people can be saved. It's explaining God's patience in delaying judgment because there's, there's people that he wants to save. And that's why he hasn't judged the world yet. There's still some people he wants to save. So that's the context of this. It's not saying that God's all confused about time. God created time. He understands it better than any of us. And so when he uses time language, it's always for our benefit and to be understood on human terms. Again, God knows how to communicate. We just don't like what he has to say. The Hebrew word for day is yom. It's used over 2,000 times in the Old Testament of the Bible in singular and plural form. Uh, the plural form is yamim. And why is it people only question the days in Genesis, the creation week in particular? I mean, they don't, have, they don't question other days in the Bible, do they? I mean, do you have heated discussions? Now, how long was Jonah really in the belly of the great fish? Were those ordinary days? Well, I think they were a thousand years each, right? He might have been in there a very long time. People just, don't, people just don't think that, right? Not at all. Or how long did Joshua really take to march around the walls of Jericho? I mean, there was, it says six days, but were those ordinary days? Oh, I think they might have been millions of years. He might have been going around there for just eons. No, no, no. We understand that. We understand those are days because that's what the word means. The Hebrew word yom, it does mean a day. And, and by the way, it can mean a period of time when used in, in, uh, in a non-literal way. Most words can be used non-literally, and that's fine. And it can mean a period of time when it's used poetically or when used as a prepositional, part of a prepositional phrase, like the day of the Lord. I do think that's longer than 24 hours. That's any period of time where God um, uh, comes in in, in, a, in, a, in a spectacular way. But the main meaning is day, that's its ordinary meaning. It's just like our English word for day. Our English word for day can mean a period of time longer than 24 hours. Back in my father's day, oh yeah. Yeah, we get that, that's a period of time longer than 24 hours. It wouldn't be millions of years, but it'd be longer than 24 hours. Back in my father's day, it took three days to drive across Texas during the day. 
So you got the word day used three times, and I'll bet you didn't have any trouble understanding it because you used context. Use the surrounding words to constrain the meaning. That's always what we do. Most words have more than one meaning, right? Look it up in a dictionary, definition one, definition two, definition three, sometimes three A, three B, three C. With all these words having multiple definitions, how is it we can even communicate? You ever thought about that? It's amazing we can communicate with each other. How do we do it? Because in a well-constructed sentence, only one meaning for each word works. Only one meaning makes sense. Uh, now, sometimes somebody will construct a sentence where you have more than one meaning. That's called an amphiboly. So if I said, you know, the, the, the student center is giving away free guitars, no strings attached, that would be an example of that, right? Because you're like, what? okay, yeah. That could mean one of two things. We get that. And those are often funny, amphibolies. You know, sometimes on church billboards you'll see those, you know, is uh, stress killing you? Let the church help. You're like, let, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> Want to know what hell is? Come hear our pastor this Sunday. You're like, I don't, I don't think that's right. <laughs> you, get the, you get the idea. But for the most part, language is pretty clear, right? Because we can use context. So back in my father's day, that, that would be a period of time took three days. Now, those would be three earth rotations, right, because it's got a number with it. So that tells you it's an ordinary day. To drive across Texas during the day, that would be the light portion of an ordinary day. So it's, it's pretty clear from context. It's the same way with Hebrew or any language. Context constrains the meaning. And so let's take a look outside of Genesis 1, where we all agree what the days mean. We find, for example, that when the word day is used in context with a number, like the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, it's always translated as day and very clearly means an ordinary day. It wouldn't be in the poetic long period of time sense. Of course, if I said on the third day he went up to such and such a city, you know that's an ordinary day, an earth rotation. We get that. Over 400 times outside of Genesis 1. There's no dispute there. If you have evening and morning together, if I said there was evening and there was morning, that would constitute an ordinary day, wouldn't it? Because those are the boundaries of a day. So you put them together, you get a day. So even if the word day isn't there, an evening and a morning constitute a day, and that happens 38 times outside of Genesis 1, and we all agree those are ordinary days. If I said there was evening that day, you'd know I'm talking about an ordinary day, because evening associated with day, that's a part of the day or, or, or a boundary of the day. Or likewise, if I said there was morning that day, you'd know I'm talking about an ordinary day. Evening with day or morning with day, either one, happens 23 times each outside of Genesis 1, and we agree those are ordinary days. Or if I contrasted day with night, I said there was day, then there was night. Well, then you know I'm talking about an ordinary day and an ordinary night for that matter. We get that. So you got it? Day with a number, evening and morning together, evening with day or morning with day, or day with an, with an, with, uh, contrasted with night. Any one of those indicate an ordinary day, and we'd, we'd expect that. That's what makes sense grammatically. So let's take a look at Genesis 1 and see if we can figure out what God meant when he said he created in six days. Genesis 1, verse 5, and God called the light day. So there he's defining it for you, days when it's light out. That's an ordinary day. The darkness he called night. You have night associated with day. That's got to be an ordinary day. You got evening associated with day. That makes it an ordinary day. You got morning associated with day. That constitutes an ordinary day. Evening and morning together. That makes an ordinary day. And you get a number with it. God used about every contextual indicator he could possibly have used. Any one of those would indicate it's an ordinary day. God used them all. There's no doubt that first day was an ordinary day. What about the other days of creation? Let's have a look here. Evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day, evening, morning, number, day. It's pretty clear, isn't it? It's almost as if God's saying, see, they're ordinary days, and in case you still don't get it, they're ordinary days. In case you're a little thick, they're ordinary days. In case you're really intellectually challenged, they're ordinary days. Okay? It's pretty clear. It is pretty clear. And uh, people say, well, he could have said 24-hour days. But you know, if you're, just, if you're determined not to believe the text, then you'll just say, yeah, but what's an hour, right? And by the way, he wouldn't have done that because hours hadn't been invented yet. They were invented by the Egyptians later, the idea of breaking up the day into 24 hours. So some people say, oh, but how could you have days? Because the sun wasn't made until the fourth day. But you don't need the sun to have day and night. You just need a light source and a rotating planet. The sun just provides the source of light today, right? But for the first three days, did we have light? And Genesis 1, 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Yeah, there was light. Do we have a rotating planet? Evening and morning were the first day. Sure did. 
You're going to have ordinary day and night. You're going to have 24-hour days before the sun. God provided the light for those first three days by whatever mechanism. He doesn't say why, how he did that. But then on the fourth day, he replaces that with the permanent light bearer, the sun, the greater light to rule the day. And uh, I don't know why he did that for sure, but I've always suspected it was so that people would be less inclined to worship the sun. Most pagan cultures worshiped the sun as the primary source of life. And so God displaces it a few days, perhaps his way of saying, I'm the primary source of life. The sun's just something that God created to sustain the life that he made. So that may be why he did that. He doesn't even call it by name in Genesis, just the greater light. Uh, you give something a name, it might be a deity. And you just, well, it's just an object that God made to, uh, to govern the day and the night. You know, all the other units of time have a basis in astronomy, except a week. Where do we get the idea of seven days in a week? Yeah. What about a day? A day comes from astronomy. That's a rotation of Earth. A month, where do we get that from? That's the amount of time it takes the moon to go through its phases. That's where we get the word month. It is a moon. Uh, the year, that's the amount of time it takes the Earth to orbit the sun. That's where we get a year. But where do we get the idea of seven days in a week? Not from astronomy. We get it from history. We get it from that. That's how long God chose to take to create and rest. And he did it that way as a pattern for us. And Exodus 20 is explicit about that. You know Exodus 20, that's the Ten Commandments. We like to memorize sections of that chapter. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And six days to do all your labor. The seventh is the Lord's. Why do we have a day of rest? Verse 11 is the explanation for why. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth to see and all that's in them. And he rested on the seventh day. And he, therefore he blessed it. He hallowed it. Okay? So God did it that way as a pattern for us. This is where the critics say, you know, why did... God rest. Was he tired? No, but he knew we would get tired, and so he did it that way as a pattern for us. God had the power to create the universe in an instant. He's all-powerful. That's not a problem. He really had to slow himself down to make in six days, but he had a reason for doing it that way because we can't do work instantly. We need time to do it, and so God did it that way as a pattern for us. And in Exodus 20, 11, it uses the plural form of yom, which is yamim, and by the way, that never means a long period of time. Yamim is always literal days. So there's no doubt about that. Back in Martin Luther's time, there were some people who were saying, oh, God really made everything in one day. They were trying to squeeze the days of creation into one. And I like how Martin Luther responds to this. He says, how long did the work of creation take? When, Mo when Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever's in them in six days, then let this period continue to have been six days and do not venture to devise any comment according to which six days were one day. I love this last part, he says, but if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. <laughs> it's a great quote, probably my favorite Martin Luther quote. He had some good ones too. <laughs> yeah, if you can't understand exactly the mechanism God used to create the universe, that's okay. He's God, you're not. Frankly, as an astrophysicist, I have enough trouble understanding how the universe works today, let alone how it was created. Something to keep in mind. What about the gap theory? This is for folks who say, yeah, there's no doubt that days are ordinary days, but maybe we can shove the millions of years in between verse 1 and verse 2. So in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth, and then maybe, maybe Lucifer was given charge of that original earth, and, and maybe he sinned, and maybe there was a flood of Lucifer, and, and all this other stuff happened. And then in verse 2, God's recreating the earth. The, they'd like to translate verse 2, and the earth became without form and void. Really can't translate it that way in that context. The Hebrew word haita just means was. So they're just wrong about that. But you, you can't put a gap of time between verse 1 and verse 2 based on the way it's worded in Hebrew. This is uh, Genesis 1 in Hebrew. Now Hebrew reads right to left, opposite of English. And verse 2 uses a grammatical construction called a vav disjunctive. That's where you have and followed by a non-verb. Earth, for example. And the earth. Earth is not a verb, it's a noun, right? So that, that's a vav disjunctive. And when you have that, it indicates that that, it, that verse is a comment or clarification or explanation of what was previously stated. Okay, so verse 2 is explaining or clarifying verse 1. You got that? It's, it's kind of like what we use parentheses for in English. It's like, think of it as a parenthetical comment. So, in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. Verse 2, parentheses, and the earth was without form and void, etc. It's explaining the conditions of the earth when it was first created. My point is you cannot put a gap of time between verse 1 and verse 2 because verse 2 doesn't follow in time. It's explaining the initial conditions of the earth when it was first created. So the gap theory has been very thoroughly refuted on the basis of the Hebrew language. 
Now, the rest of Genesis is different. It's above consecutive. That's and followed by a verb, and that does follow in time. So God did create sequentially, but verse 2 doesn't happen after verse 1. Verse 2 is explaining verse 1, clarifying it. It's pointing out that when God first made the earth, it wasn't like it was today. It wasn't full of life and continents separated from oceans. It was a empty, formless mass. And then God spends the rest of the creation week forming it and filling it. So it makes sense. There's a lot of science that goes along with that. I'll just whet your appetite a little bit. C14, you've heard of carbon dating? A lot of people think have the, they have the misimpression that carbon dating is what secularists use to get the millions of years. It isn't. There are other methods they use, uranium, lead, potassium, argon. Um, but carbon dating tends to give ages that are roughly consistent with the biblical time scale. So it's one of the more reliable methods. And when we test it on things of known age, it tends to give an answer close to the correct answer. It's based on C14. C14 is a variety of carbon, uh, an isotope of carbon that decays into nitrogen. Most carbon C12, and it's stable. It will remain C12 forever. C14 is unstable. And one atom in a trillion of carbon is C14. And those two extra neutrons make it unstable, meaning it will decay into nitrogen. You don't have to do anything to it. Just spontaneously, it'll just pop. It'll change into nitrogen with a half-life of 5,700 years, something like that. So you have a chunk of solid C14. The atoms, one by one, are popping, pop, 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 like popcorn. They're changing into nitrogen. And it takes 5,700 years for half of it to have decayed to nitrogen. The bottom line is C14 does not last millions of years. If the entire Earth were nothing but C14, after one million years, you'd not have one atom left. It would have all decayed into nitrogen. And so the fact that we have C14 and things like diamonds that are well insulated from cosmic rays deep down in the Earth shows they can't be anywhere near uh, millions, let alone billions of years old. They're a few thousand years old. Lots of stuff like that. I have other presentations I do on that. But what I want to do at this point is ask, does it matter? Because historically, the secularists came along and argued that, you know, the Bible's not true because these rock layers are millions of years old. We think these were deposited gradually over hundreds of millions of years. I think a worldwide flood laid down most of them, but that's, in any case, a lot of the theologians compromised. Not all of them, but a lot of them did. And they thought, well, you know, since it's not a salvation issue, I mean, you know, the Bible doesn't claim you have to believe in six days to be saved. You have to believe in Jesus to be saved, right? We're saved by grace, received through faith in Christ. And so a lot of the theologians allowed for these different positions. I think they were well-meaning. And I agree that it's not a salvation issue in the sense that nobody's claiming you have to believe in six days to be saved. I'm, I'm certainly not claiming that. Uh, I do think you have to believe in six days to be rationally consistent, right? Because Jesus believed in Genesis and often quoted from it or alluded to it. And so he clearly believed that. And so if I'm a Christian... How can I say, I follow Jesus, but he was wrong about almost everything. That doesn't make sense, right? It is an important issue, and it's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's important because it is what the Bible teaches. Most of us can't read the Bible in the original languages, but that's no excuse these days. You can get multiple translations. They all say the same thing when it comes to Genesis. You know it's been well translated. You can go back and you know, with, with the computer software, and you can look at the actual Hebrew words, and you can look at them and see how they're used in other, other places. And Yeah, there's no doubt, six days. No doubt there. See, the same Bible that teaches that God created in six days also teaches a virgin birth of Christ, that Jesus turned water into wine, walked on water, calmed the storm, raised the dead. He raised himself from the dead. Same Bible teaches all those things, right? But if you say, yes, but I'm not sure about the six days of creation because most scientists say that's not possible. Well, I got news for you. Most scientists would say virgin birth's not possible. Turning water into wine's not possible. Resurrection from the dead's not possible. You gonna reinterpret those portions too? And by the way, the re Jesus' resurrection, that is a salvation issue. If he's not raised, you're still in your sins, your faith is in vain, the Bible itself says that. So are you gonna reinterpret that? You better not, that is a salvation issue. Now, as some people would say, oh, but that, that list on the right there, Dr. Lau, those are miracles. And so they're not constrained by, you know, the conclusions of, of, of scientists. I agree. But then again, wasn't the creation of the universe a miracle? If not, I'd like to see you do it, right? <laughs> There's another reason why you don't want to add in the millions of years, and that concerns these fossils that we find all over the Earth. And we do find fossils everywhere. We find even marine fossils on the highest mountains. Mount Everest has marine fossils on the top of it. I'd expect that. There was a worldwide flood. But secularists reject the worldwide flood because they need to believe that these fossils were deposited gradually over hundreds of millions of years. One worldwide flood would deposit the bulk of them, with a few afterwards, perhaps. But a fossil's a dead thing. 
And if you got death 65 million years ago, you got a theological problem because you got death before Adam sinned. In fact, you got death before Adam existed. We all agree human beings don't go back 65 million years. But doesn't the Bible say that death came into the world by Adam's sin? By, one, by man came death? That's mentioned not just in Genesis, but it's reiterated in Romans and in 1 Corinthians. But you see, if you believe in millions of years, if you believe the fossils are millions of years old, even if you don't believe in evolution, you just think, maybe, well, maybe God created progressively over millions of years, then you got, by death came man. Which is it? By death came man or by man came death? Those are logically contrary positions. They cannot both be true. You're going to have to decide. You're going to go with God's word or man's word. You can just imagine uh, Adam and Eve enjoying that very good creation sitting there in the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Delight. And by the way, it wasn't just the Garden of Eden. The Bible says God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good, which we'd expect nothing less of the biblical God. So originally, creation was very good. But you see, if the fossils were already there, and creatures were living and dying and ripping the guts out of other creatures for millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, and then God finally got around to making the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. That means you got the Garden of Eden sitting on top of millions of years of death, suffering, disease, bloodshed, carnivorous activity. You know, we find evidence of uh, disease in, in some of these fossils. There's a field called paleopathology that studies disease in fossils. We find evidence of things like arthritis, cancer even, where there's already in the world when God then created the you know, Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, and said, oh, it's very good. With all these diseases already in the world, Animals killing animals already in the world? Hmm. That's a problem. Some people say, oh, I think it was just human death that was introduced when Adam and Eve sinned. I don't think you can defend that biblically because if you think about it, when Adam and Eve sinned and God confronted them, he provided skins of clothing. Those would be animal skins, which means God killed an animal or animals to provide skins of clothing for Adam and Eve. So God instituted animal death when Adam sinned. But, and some people think, well, that's not fair. It, why do the animals have to suffer when Adam's the one that, was, that sinned? That's the nature of dominion. God gave Adam dominion over the world. He was an, he was an authority. And when it, someone is an authority and they do something wicked, all, everything under their authority suffers as a result of that. We understand that. When our government does something stupid, we all suffer as a result of it. That's the nature of authority. You don't have it so bad here in Florida, but trust me. <laughs> This plays out really well in California, let me tell you. <laughs> so, yeah, so animals, animals do die, and it's our fault because we were given charge over the world and we rebelled against God. Now, some people say, oh, but you have to at least have plant death before Adam and Eve sinned. But the interesting thing is, biblically, plants are not considered living. They don't literally die because they're not literally alive to begin with. In, in the biblical sense of the term life, uh, the Hebrew word for life, nephesh, Nefesh kai, living creatures. Uh, that term is applied to human beings, it's applied to animals. Plants are never referred to in scripture as nefesh kai, as living creatures, ever. They are classified as food for living creatures, albeit self-replicating food, which is pretty neat. Only God could think of something like that. But uh, now we can talk about you know, a dead plant, but we're being somewhat non-literal. We're using perhaps a different definition of life. I know modern biologists classify plants as living, but that's a different definition. And we, we, we understand they're not alive in the same way that an animal is or that a human being is. They're different. They don't have, you know, desires and conscious reflection and so on. And so you can talk about a dead tree in the same way you can talk about a dead battery. That doesn't mean it was ever literally alive. And we, and we get that. We get the difference. You come across a so-called dead tree. That's nice. I think I'll sit on that for a little while, take a picture of it, put it over the mantle. That's great. That's peaceful. If you come across a dead animal, you say, well, that's nice. I think I'll sit on that for a little while, take a picture of it. <laughs> It's different, isn't it? Yes. We recognize animal death as an intrusion into a world that was once very good and today is not very good. There's still a lot of beauty in this world, don't get me wrong, but there's ugliness too. And the Bible explains that. The Bible accounts for that. So the church is preaching this message, come to Jesus, come to the cross and be saved. That's the right message, the gospel. And there's been an attack. One of the attacks is millions of years. And that impacts... And the, the funny thing is we're inclined to think, well, that's a miss. That didn't hit the cross. Millions of years is not a salvation issue. But the funny thing is, millions of years is an attack on Genesis. And Genesis is foundational to the gospel. If the gospel is the good news, Genesis is the bad news that we need to understand in order to understand the good news. 
It's because what Adam did, we need a savior. Satan's crafty. If he were aiming at the cross, we'd be concerned. Oh, you can get books to defend the resurrection. And so some, you know, some critic says, oh, there was no Jesus. And there, in any case, even if you lived, there was no resurrection. You can get books to defend that. We understand that's a salvation issue. And it is. Satan's crafty. He aims at our foundation. We think it's just a side issue. It's a foundational issue. Is the Bible really the authoritative word of God? In which case, it can't be wrong on anything that it affirms. All these different attacks came historically. Naturalism, evolution, eight men, millions of years, no global flood, they impact. Once again, we think that's a miss. Really, it was a direct hit. And the result of all these different attacks on Genesis is unbelief. We live now in a culture where probably the majority of people don't really believe the Bible as the inerrant word of God. And that is, uh, that's very unfortunate, but it's, I suggest it's primarily from attacks on Genesis. And then of course, once that, that's, not, that's where it begins, it's not where it ends. Then they start attacking other scriptures, but that's where they claim that the science has demonstrated the Bible's false, which is not true, but that's what they claim. These symptoms happen, prayers out loud in schools, and boy, that bugs us. Well, trust in Jesus, which we should do, but we're not dealing with the problem. Creation's out loud in schools, and that bothers us. Well, Jesus is gonna return. Yeah, he is, but he's told us to do some things in the meantime, like make disciples of all nations and be ready to give an answer when any, anyone asks a reason of the hope that's in us with gentleness and respect. The Bible's outlawed in schools. Well, let's get the Bible back into schools. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm all for doing what can be done on, on the political front, but if the culture's gonna be one to Christ, it won't be through politics. It'll be through the proclamation and defense of the gospel, okay? And you say, well, if we could just get the right guy in, well, then an evil population will vote him out the next term, right? So, I mean, that's just the way it works. We're seeing this happen. We understand this. So, Ten Commandments outlawed in schools. Let's concentrate on worship. The church can be doing a lot of good things, but we've missed the boat if we're not giving that answer, if we're not being prepared to deal with these attacks on Genesis. And that's why I founded the Biblical Science Institute. Uh, we want to come alongside the church. We're parish church ministry. Of course, I'm a member of my own local church body. But uh, as a parachurch ministry, we come alongside the church, repair the damage, show you can trust in Genesis. And again, I, as a scientist, I specialize in, in showing how the science lines up with biblical creation and how it refutes evolution. And then when these different attacks come, we want to warn you, these are attacks on the Christian faith. And then we show you how to refute all those different arguments with the various resources that we have out front. And then we'd like everyone in the church to recognize that these are attacks on the Christian faith. They're not just irrelevant side issues. They do matter. And we'd like everyone to be able to refute these arguments with the resources that we put out. God calls a few of us to go out and specialize and get a PhD and study certain issues very carefully, but we're, we're all called to defend the Christian faith. If you're a Christian, you're an apologist, right? And an evangelist. You're, you're supposed to preach the gospel and defend the gospel. Then the church can say, come to Jesus, come to the cross and be saved. And people say, I get it now. It's because of what Adam did that I need a savior. I'm born into a world rebelling against God. I've committed high treason against the King of Kings. That's a capital offense. I deserve not only death, but an infinite death, having sinned against an infinitely holy God. People who don't think they deserve hell do not understand the holiness of God. They really don't. That's why we need a savior. That's what it comes down to. Well, our uh, website, biblicalscienceinstitute.com, make sure you check that out. It's a free website for you to enjoy. Uh, some of the resources that we have out back, make sure you check these out. This presentation, Understanding Genesis, we have that on DVD. Uh, if you have maybe a friend who needs to hear that, well, there you can bring it to them. Uh, Understanding Genesis, the, the book, uh, because I'm, I've been told I sometimes talk too fast, so I wrote the book really slowly. You can take your time with that, and, and that's not a problem. So, and I'll go into a little more detail, too, on some of these things and give you some examples and so, so forth. Uh, ultimate proof of creation, if you want a bulletproof argument that you can use to to just demonstrate that creation is true and refute evolution, this will do it. And it's very different from the kind of arguments that people are assuming. It doesn't involve a lot of uh, details of science and things like that, uh, but uh, I won't spoil it for you. If you want to get that, I think it's a very powerful resource. And we have that on DVD as well. Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky. This is just how to enjoy the night sky from a Christian perspective. This is a fun resource. And uh, if you want to get a telescope, what kind you might want to get and how to use it. But there's a lot of stuff you can see naked eye or there's star clusters you can see in binoculars. They're beautiful. Just got to know where to look, and that's where the book will help you. And then if you want more of an apologetic resource, taking back astronomy would be it. That's going to refute the Big Bang and the billions of years and show you how astronomy declares God's glory. Uh, I've got some a little more detailed books on the physics of Einstein, if you've ever wondered about 
E equals MC squared, and what about black holes, and is time travel possible, and things like that. Truth is stranger than fiction, let me tell you. And that's a, that's a fun, fun read. I wrote it kind of on two levels. It's written for laymen, but I put in-depth in boxes for those who want to go into a little more. Those who have a science background want to go a little more in-depth. So you can sort of read it either way. Keeping faith in an age of reason answers over 400 alleged Bible contradictions. You've heard the critics say, well, you can't trust the Bible because this verse contradicts that verse. Well, they really don't. I checked. And uh, so I, I wrote the book on that, and you can kind of go through that. And uh, most of them, the critic just wasn't reading the text carefully. But there's some where I had to go back to the original language, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, introduction to logic. That's a powerful resource. How to think properly. I found that that's, it's better to know how to use your mind than to know just lots of facts about stuff, but not know how to use them. So right thinking and spotting fallacious thinking, errors in reasoning. And, uh, and showing how logic really is rooted in the nature of the Christian God. And no other, no other God can make sense of laws of logic as we have them. And if you want to use that with your like homeschooled students, we have a teacher's guide too that has tests and quizzes. You might uh, pick that up as well. Uh, lately, for my, my home church, I led a Sunday school series, uh, 10 Sunday school lessons, and we recorded that. It goes through this book, and so we call it the Get Logical series. And so you might want to use that with your own church or for your own uh, private study. Uh, dinosaurs in the Bible, this is a fun one, especially for youngsters, uh, because youngsters like dinosaurs, and frankly, so do I. They're, they're cool. And the Bible does have something to say about that topic, so uh, that's a fun resource. You can get the best of our books together for a 20% discount. That's our book pack. You can get the best of our videos together, our DVD pack, for a 20% discount. You can get kind of the best of everything. That's our library pack. That's a 30% discount. We only do that at conferences like this. The individual resources you can get on the website, but if you want to get the, the packs at a discount, uh, do that here tonight. We also brought some children's resources as well. I highly recommend these. I didn't write them, but I highly recommend them. Uh, Answers Books for Kids, beautiful, beautifully illustrated, colorful. Kids will love them, and they're, they give you scientifically and theologically accurate answers to a lot of the questions that, that's, that uh, youngsters ask about the Bible, science, creation, and so on. We do have a free monthly newsletter. And so uh, please sign up for that. It's an electronic newsletter, so make sure you put your email, legibly, all right? So we've got to put this into the computer. And uh, that'll come out usually on the 15th of each month. It'll just kind of let you know what we're doing at the Biblical Science Institute. So please do sign up for that. We just want to bless you. There's no catch, okay? So not too many things free in this world, just salvation and our newsletter. And then uh, check us out on the web as well at biblicalscienceinstitute.com. We're going to take a 15-minute break, and we'll be back here and talk about the Bethlehem Star. Thank you.